uh, you're not going to be able to sustain these really high temperatures, and you won't get your fusion reaction, power your hair dryers, microwaves, and uh, what is that, uh, Netflix, yes. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want uh, the, the, the plasma to lock in the particles too much, because then you get a buildup of impurities, you know? It's sort of like, uh, let's see, you have a, a, a party, and, and you have a bunch of people coming, and more people keep coming, but nobody leaves, and, and you get some nasty people sometimes in the party and they make a disturbance, and that's not good. So you want to have the door open for particles to get out, um, but you also want to keep the heat in. Now we have this uh, frustrating situation, right? Usually, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So either you can have low confinement, and then you lose the heat and particles rapidly, and this is not such a good uh, thermos for your plasma coffee. Um, or you have high confinement, you hold on to the heat well, but then the impurities build up and you don't get a steady state of sustainable plasma. And then, you know, there are some uh, kinds of, of fluctuations we call ELMs, edge localized modes. They live out at the edge of the plasma. They're sort of bursting. We get this gradient that builds up in the edge of the plasma, a lot of free energy stored in that gradient, and then it releases like a pressure cooker. Uh, and, you, and you have this uh, bursting mode, and it spits out the impurities. And that's great, except not in a real reactor, because spitting out the impurities in a reactor which elephants can fit inside, you can imagine those are pretty big spits. Um, and so we can start to damage the wall. So that's also frustrating. But we have other fluctuations uh, that can do the job for us. Um, so in a number of, of confinement regimes, I have a number listed up here, the EEA or enhanced D alpha H mode, I'll talk about that in a bit. The I mode is another uh, uh, topic that we study here at CMOD. Um, and uh, that has also a quiescent H mode at D3D uh, and some other uh, modes as well. Uh, there's a QCM-like fluctuation for this uh, JFT2M mode, edge recycling, uh, high recycling steady edge mode. And then, in fact, the last one is from a stellarator, uh, so that's quite interesting as well. Uh, but in all of these cases, we have a continuous fluctuation, lives out at the edge, uh, and it plays this role of flushing impurities from the plasma uh, without the bursting instabilities which can damage the wall. Okay, uh, so here is uh, one of those modes, and it's uh, the primary uh, regime we'll be operating in today. It's the enhanced the alpha H mode. Um, so, so what are we looking at here? The, the top pane is a spectrogram. That's uh, taking a signal, chopping it up into short bins, and looking at the spectral content in each bin. Uh, this is a way to look at how the spectral content changes, evolves over time. And the signal uh, here is from the phase contrast imaging diagnostic. I'll take the opportunity now also to thank the phase contrast imaging and polar imagery teams uh, who have been uh, uh, the custodians of those diagnostics. Um, and so uh, it's giving us line integrated density fluctuations. So, and now let's do a little bit of a play by play looking at these parameter traces uh, underneath the density, uh, the, the average density line average, the H alpha light and the radiated power. Okay, so we start off in L mode, density is low, okay, so we're, we're doing here, and then we, we get a, a sudden change of what we call a break in slope in density. We get a kick in density, this is control room parlance. We have a kick here, density screams up, we have a drop in H alpha light, stuff is coming out of the plasma less now. Radiated power picking up, uh oh, we have impurities and they're causing a problem here. Density is screaming up, 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 and then crash, okay? We, we, we lose it, we back transition back to L mode uh, because of these guys. Now, uh, we, we, we come back down and then we have another kick uh, and the density starts to come up, but not so fast, right? Not so fast now. And uh, the H alpha light is also coming up slowly, 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 while the radiated power stays pretty low. This is a steady state mode. What's the difference? The difference is this feature here in the PCI spectrogram, which we call the quasi-coherent mode. It's a fluctuation, a short wavelength, high uh, perpendicular wave number, about one and a half uh, inverse centimeters, comes down and in frequency, then it settles and sort of has this uh, frequency modulation, sometimes around 60 hertz sometimes uh, higher with the sawtooth uh, frequency. And this mode uh, is uh, responsible for uh, cleaning out the plasma, flushing those impurities, without degrading the performance uh, very much. So let's uh, see another feature of the quasi-coherent mode. It also has a magnetic signature in addition to a density signature. 
Uh, and this uh, gives us an idea. Well, okay, if there's a magnetic wiggle, that means there are currents too. And uh, maybe we can make those currents making using a magnetic wiggle from the outside of the plasma. Maybe we can induce a fluctuation that looks like the quasi-coherent mode. And wouldn't that be nice? Then we press a button and stuff comes out. And we turn the button off. We can tune it back. It's a transport actuator. That'd be a nice idea. Fun experiment to try. Um, now, let's try to visualize these modes. This is not the quasi-coherent mode. This is an edge-localized mode, one of the first in uh, from the mega amp spherical <coughs> tokamak in the UK. Um, and so, uh, what are some features that we can see from this great image? Um, we, we see these sort of long, spindly structures. Those are current filaments, and they're following field lines. So, uh, for those people who are uh, new to tokamak physics, uh, what's happening, we have these field lines that are sort of wrapping around the plasma of the helix. Uh, and uh, in this case, we have current filaments that are following along those field lines. Um, another feature is, uh, it might be a little hard to tell, but if you already know the answer, you know that uh, the, the mode is really only existing on the outer half of the plasma, the low field side, the bad curvature side, not the high field side, good curvature side. Um, so it's, uh, it's a ballooning mode. Um, Another feature is that the filaments are kind of close together. Uh, so uh, now, not so much in, in this mode as they are in the quasi-coherent mode. Uh, they're, they're a perpendicular <coughs> wavelength of 4.2 centimeters or so. Um, of course, that changes and also depends on whether you're at the mid-plane up or down. Um, but they're pretty closely uh, spaced, um, so high k per. Now, uh, so this is this picture that we have in our mind if these modes look like current filaments, can we try to drive those same filaments and uh, get the same action from the mode? And so that's why we built this structure, which we call the shoelace antenna. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that in just a little bit. So let's get into that. Oh, how did that get there? These are some members of the shoelace antenna team. Uh, we have Rui, we have Jeff, we have Rick, we have Brian, we have Jim Zacks on the left, and pre-beard me. Um, now, so uh, some of the, the high-level goals for the antenna, we want to ask, can we use it as an active probe? Can we turn it on and learn things uh, about the quasi-coherent mode? Can we use it as a mode trigger, okay? Can I sort of say, I'm going to turn my EDAH mo mode on now. Uh, here's what I want it to be, or make it appear sooner. Uh, can we use it as a plasma motor? You saw some current filaments there. We have some, some currents driving in the plasma. This sort of looks like an AC motor. Maybe we can impart the torque to plasma. Can we use it as a transport actuator? We've spoken about that. Um, so now, let's try to wrap our heads around this. So how is this antenna constructed? We have a, a single winding of, of molybdenum wire. Uh, it goes around and around and around. The bottom layer comes up and then traces its uh, path back down again. Uh, that looks like a shoelace, so we call it the shoelace antenna. Uh, we can drive it anywhere in the frequency range from 50 to 300 kilohertz. On a good day, you could even go a little bit outside of that range. We have up to 2 kilowatts of source power. We get a good deal of that piece of the antenna, as you'll see. Uh, now, uh, to think about how the antenna works, one way you can conceptualize it is uh, a bunch of these little uh, flux uh, loops sort of pushing and pulling flux in and out, and pushing and pulling, perturbing the edge of the plasma. You can also think of it as inducing mirror currents right at the edge of the plasma. Plasmas are conductors, excellent ones. Um, now, an another uh, important feature here uh, to, to compare the antenna to other antennas will become apparent. Let's do that comparison now. Um, so, uh, on, on, what's this? this? Stage right, house left, we have uh, the active MHD antenna. This is uh, one PhD thesis ago, and this was designed to excite Aldane eigenmodes uh, at CMI. Uh, in the center, we have some excitation <coughs> structures for linear devices, Vinetta in particular in Europe, uh, by Grant and Wilkie's group. Um, I guess Wilkie is the PI there. And uh, so uh, these structures are specifically built to drive drift waves uh, and interact with existing drift waves, both coherent and turbulent. Then we have the shoelace antenna. Underneath we have uh, an Alvane wave uh, experiment from the 80s. It's sort of like a single rung from uh, the shoelace antenna. And it was also meant to drive Alvane eigenmodes. It actually was a sort of a pre-active MHD diagnostic. They were doing it before active MHD was cool. Um, now, one 
thing that sets the shoelace antenna design apart, which is really important, uh, is that it has this high perpendicular wave number. Um, so one implication that this has is that the vacuum field uh, produced by the antenna falls off very rapidly uh, from each layer roughly as the, uh, the e to the negative k per uh, r radian. And so what does that mean? Uh, that means you have an e-folding length of something like uh, two-thirds of a centimeter. Um, so we have a very rapid decay. So what does that mean? It means you have to get the antenna very close to the plasma. Um, now, remember we said the temperature of the plasma. Now, of course, the core temperature is 100 million degrees Celsius-ish. The edge is cooler. Um, but it's still not something you want to be so close to. Now, how close do we get the antenna? Well, we designed it to be, I say five millimeters here, it's really three millimeters at closest approach, recessed behind the main limiter. Um, so that's quite close. Uh, we'll see what happens when you put an antenna that close a little bit later. Um, but uh, that has a huge uh, restrictions on the design. It means you have to design a very robust antenna. It also means your power system uh, has to do it the best job to get the most amount of power and current in the antenna uh, so that you can drive the biggest perturbation uh, you are able. So let's describe that power system a little bit here. Um, what we do is we couple uh, our, our source power from two commercial 50 uh, amplifiers to our load, which is a, uh, an inductive short. It's got an inductance around six microhenries, a resistance around half a mole. That changes with frequency due to the skin effect. Uh, and we, in between, we have a matching network. It's an L network topology uh, combined with this transformer combiner. Now, uh, this would be nice if we had only a single frequency we would be interested in driving. You can make a nice, big uh, unit, huge capacitors, enormous, never break down. Um, and only one set. But actually, you saw in the beginning this quasi-coherent mode and the frequency swept down, and then on top of that, there's this wiggle. And so the frequency is moving quite rapidly, and we want to be able uh, either to scan the frequency around it or even try to follow it. Uh, and that means that this matching network has to be agile. It has to be able to handle multiple frequencies. Um, and the way that we do that uh, is we build those capacitors to be discretely variable. And now we should distinguish, this is not broadband in the sense of passing multiple frequencies simultaneously. Uh, it's wide range. We have a narrow pass band which is tuned, it's moved around uh, the frequency range uh, and always sits right on the drive frequency. And so the way that we do that is we switch in, I have some show and tell in here, uh, which I guess I can pass around the room. But we switch in, this is a prototype board, so uh, we don't actually use it. That's why it's here. Uh, uh, capacitors uh, using solid state switching. We have uh, a number of channels and we add them and subtract them from the total capacitance uh, in real time um, in order to have the correct two. Um, here's a picture, and, and some of you will get to see the, the prototype as well, of one of the actual matching networks. Here are uh, four parallel channels, four series channels, small spets underneath to do the switching. Um, on the the left side, house left here, is a picture of the integrated matching network, all those LEDs telling us it's working. Um, on the right, we have the Maxi control board, which is responsible for interrogating the drive frequency in real time and picking the correct tune and telling the other boards uh, what they should be doing. We got very good performance from this matching network, so that the top figure here is the fraction of power entering the matching network, not the antenna. We get about 85% power in the antenna dissipated in the, in the winding resistance. Um, and it is dissipated resistively uh, as opposed to uh, uh, entering the plasma primarily. Um, but we can get uh, most of the source power uh, into the matching network, certainly in the QCM uh, range, which is sort of down here, 50 to uh, 150, 200, depending on who you ask. Um, at the higher frequencies, we get a little bit less performance. That's also why we have to sort of turn the power down at the source to avoid trips. Um, this power system will be upgraded soon. We'll talk about that later. All right, let's get into physics. Um, so most of what I'll talk about today, uh, in fact, all 
is uh, what happens when we turn the antenna on. But of course, you can also uh, go the other way and use it as a receiver. And when you do that, you get a, a receiver which is a, a filter in K purpose, very selective. Um, so it should be sensitive, uh, for example, to the quasi coherent mode as well as the weakly coherent mode. And, uh, and we want to check that. So here we check that. Uh, at the bottom, I have a, a sort of a small PCI spectrogram, again measuring density, line integrated density fluctuations. At the top, I'm showing a, a short time magnitude squared coherence spectrogram. So what is that? The magnitude squared coherence is telling you something about how two signals are correlated. Um, and so I, I see this, this feature here I associate with the QCM from PCI. And then I look at the magnitude squared coherence between the PCI density signal and the uh, pickup voltage induced over the antenna, uh, merit of the uh, coupled radial flux from the quasi coherent mode. And I see there is, in fact, a strong coherence between the signal on the antenna and the signal in PCI. So I'm fairly confident that indeed the antenna does uh, pick up the QCM. That's a good sign. Okay, now let's look a, a bit uh, before we, we look at this data, introduce some of the diagnostics. I want to emphasize uh, three uh, of the available diagnostics here, the phase contrast imaging system that consists of 32 cores viewing down vertically uh, through the plasma and measuring line integrated density. Uh, polarimetry cores, those are sensitive in principle <coughs> to uh, field and density fluctuations, though in the present context, because the mode is at the edge, um, right where the as a primarily orthogonal uh, tuning cord. Uh, the polarimetry is really just measuring the density of response. We'll see that a little bit later. The Mirnov coils measure fluctuations in the colloidal magnetic field. Uh, those are the diagnostics that uh, observe the shoelace fluctuation. Uh, uh, several others, including the scanning uh, mirror Langmuir probe, the reflectometer, and the gas puff imaging diagnostic, do not, we'll explain why. That's frustrating. These are three diagnostics which could give you a radio location for the mode, and they all happen to be in the same spot, which is blind for the shoelace. Uh, anyway, uh, so what happened? We turn the antenna on. We have another one of these spectrograms here. This is from a Mirnov coil measuring colloidal magnetic field fluctuations. Um, so, okay. Uh, we, we see another H mode. Okay, we have this density signal coming along, coming along. Kick jumps up, right? Uh, H-alpha light drops and then starts to come up as we get into EDH <coughs> mode uh, from Elm-3. And there's the QCM, okay, nice bright feature of the quasi coherent mode. But, now this is really only for the people in the front row, sorry guys in the back, but you can see if you squint this little triangle wave going up and down and up and down and up and down, and what's that? That's the shoelace antenna scanning in frequency. And hey, if we look at the PCI spectrogram, you see, oh look, here's this uh, triangle wave going up and down, up and down, up and down. Wait a minute, this antenna makes uh, wiggles in magnetic field, but here we're also making wiggles in density, and that's impressive. Uh, now another feature is there's no triangle on the left. Okay, so let's remedy this issue now for the people in the back row. Um, we can look at the magnitude squared coherence now between uh, density uh, fluctuation uh, actually, in this case, a, a magnetic field fluctuation, but one of the diagnostic signals and the antenna current. Um, and so we see a strong coherent response on the fluctuation signal uh, from the antenna. And for this magnetic field uh, fluctuation, that uh, response exists uh, for the duration of the discharge and pulse of the antenna. For the density response from PCI, it only occurs after we get into H mode when these steep gradients appear edge. Um, and if uh, we want more confirmation of this, we see the same response on polarimetry. Again, this is more uh, evidence that, that polarimetry is picking up density by comparison with the uh, PCI density fluctuation. Another feature of the driven mode is that uh, it's not uh, everywhere on the low field side. Uh, and and uh, this we alluded to uh, a little bit earlier. So what are we looking at here? This is a colloidal cross section, a, a sort of a cut uh, down uh, in, in the tokamak. Um, and I'm showing two Mirnov coils on extensions from the wall. Um, this is between E and F cores for CMOD aficionados. Uh, so on the bottom Mirnov coil, we see this strong coherent response for the duration of the discharge. But on the top Mirnov coil, almost none. Even though they're displaced the same distance toroidally from the antenna, 
One sees a big response, one doesn't. Uh, so to get at how, uh, why this occurs, we're gonna do a little mapping exercise here. So the way that I do that is I project the rungs of the antenna onto the last closed flux surface at the point where the, the rung intersects the last closed flux surface on these lines. I follow, I integrate the field lines along the last closed flux surface. And in that way I say, does the antenna map, does it connect on a field line to a structure or not? Um, and so here's a plan view of CMA. The letters are the ports. Uh, some of you might notice there's no I, and that's, of course, because it's imaginary. Um, so we, we are looking again at these diagnostics. That's the polar emitter. This is a, no, sorry, this is the polar emitter. This is the phase contrast imaging. Here's a subset of the Mirnov coils, and these uh, nice set of diagnostics here are blind uh, to the antenna because they don't map to the antenna on field lines on the last closed flux surface. Here, if I unwrap the, the tokamak, so I chop it and spread it out, um, I can plot those field lines again. I get this tube or bundle of, of, of field lines. On that tube, I uh, mapped to the antenna, uh, and I can pick up the fluctuation. Off of it, I do not see uh, any uh, perturbed response. Now, um, uh, here's a, a cross-section view of the PCI. This might be uh, a little bit useful for the slides coming up. So again, we have 32 cords that are viewing down into the plasma, and they intersect, most of them, uh, with these sort of, you can, you can barely see, uh, but there's uh, blue and orange lines here, um, which correspond to these field lines there. Uh, and so we say, okay, the PCI diagnostic uh, can pick up the response. Uh, one thing you can do, and in addition to looking at uh, the magnitude of the coherence, you can pick out the phase angle. What you can do is you can say, I have a phase angle at every one of my PCI cores, which has a sort of a, a major radial label associated with it, and I can say, all right, I'm, I'm moving along the phase of my wavelength up and down, and I can say, here, I'm at this phase, then I go up, then I go up, then I come down, and I can measure the radial, major radial wavelength in this way, and I can pull off a uh, major radial wave number. That's what I do here. Uh, so what we do is we, we make this omega k plot um, for the antenna, uh, and we sort of uh, keep checking it in time to see how the spectrum changes. On the bottom, I'm showing the magnitude squared coherence again, and we'll follow uh, what the antenna is doing. So we start out, uh, this dashed line is the antenna frequency, and boom, we, we, we is born a little fluctuation from the antenna. It's moving up and down in frequency, uh, just like uh, what the antenna drive is doing. It's picking out a particular radial wave number, however. Now, another interesting feature is that that radial wave number is only on one side. The mode is only propagating in one direction. Remember that the antenna uh, has no preferred direction. The vacuum field is a standing wave uh, in uh, the poloidal dimension. Um, and yet, the driven mode picks uh, particular direction. It happens to be the electron diamagnetic drift direction, as we'll see. Oops, come on. All right, um, so now uh, we can be a little bit fancier uh, about how we, we calculate the wave number. So what we can do is we can uh, make this <coughs> assumption that uh, the, the mode is roughly field aligned. The perpendicular wave number is much bigger than the parallel wave number. The phase changes slowly along the field line. Um, and I can associate uh, a mapped coordinate with every one of my PCI cores. Instead of a major radius, now I'm going to use a, a coordinate which labels the field line. Which field line am I on? It's constant along the field line. Uh, for those that are interested, uh, the way that uh, I do this uh, is uh, I take the, the point where the PCI cord intersects the last closed flux surface. At that point, I, I map on a field line back to the outer mid plane and I read off. Uh, the toroidal angle where that field line hits the outer midplane, I take that uh, as this mapped coordinate. So if I, I use that here as this uh, zeta parameter, and uh, then I plot that against uh, the phase angle on each one of these PCI cores, and I unwrap that phase angle so it doesn't go up and down and up and down, but it keeps going up. I can fit uh, a line to that and pull out a mode number. In fact, I pull out the toroidal mode number at the outer and in that case. So, uh, and it, it happens to be the same <coughs> toroidal mode number as imposed by the antenna winding. 
Uh, I can also compare that toroidal mode number with other diagnostics like the mirror coils, and when I do, I get the same number. Um, now, I can also turn that <coughs> toroidal mode number, again with this field aligned assumption, uh, into a perpendicular wave number uh, at the outer mid plane. Uh, when I do that, I, I come to life with a plot like this. So, uh, in the top here, I'm, I'm plotting the, the perpendicular wave number that I calculate from the phase contrast imaging diagnostic. Uh, and I plot together reference for what the antenna is built uh, to drive. So remember, the antenna can drive either a positive or negative running uh, wave. It has a standing wave of vacuum field. But uh, the phase contrast imaging diagnostic shows that, so first I get some hash before the, the, the phase relationship between the PCI cores settles. Then, right as I get to H mode, uh, the phase relationship settles and I plug the antenna wave number precisely for the rest of the discharge. Um, there's a little bit of uh, fuzz here. But I, I, I plug <coughs> tightly this uh, perpendicular wave number and only the, the positive uh, going uh, direction. Um, and also, I can say, well, OK, what happens if that I change the direction of the field? Um, uh, that changes the direction of the electron diamagnetic drift direction, which forward field is positive. Okay, I change the direction of the field. I invert the direction of the, oh, also the, the plasma current, I should mention. Uh, I invert the direction of the electron diamagnetic drift direction, and I also invert the wave number uh, uh, that the mode uh, exhibits. So now instead of plus one and a half inverse centimeters, I have minus one and a half inverse centimeters. This discharge, sadly, its life was cut short. Um, but it had a great H mode in the beginning. It lived fast and died young. Okay, um, now, in addition to looking at the uh, magnitude squared coherence, I can also look at the transfer function. You can conceptualize this as output over input, okay? Um, so, as I drive the antenna frequency, uh, let's look at the bottom plot first. This, uh, uh, this frequency here, the blue scanning frequency is the antenna drive frequency, and the black, uh, solid line here uh, that's wiggling. That's the peak in the in a PCI spectrum evolving in time. I use that as a proxy for the QCM uh, center frequency. We see that every time the antenna crosses the PCI peak frequency, I get a big response, um, something that, that looks like uh, a peak, like a resonance, in fact. Um, so and. That, that's interesting because even when there's no QCM, and here's a spectrogram of the PCI from that short uh, discharge, uh, which didn't have a, a prominent QCM, I still get peaks in the response, even when there's no uh, QCM. They're not quite as, as big as they were before, but they're still peaks. Um, now, uh, I can try to say, well, can I use this method to estimate the amplitude of the by scaling the transfer function uh, output over input by the input by the antenna curve. When I do that and I compare it with the, the peak amplitude in uh, the PCI spectrum here, that's the black line and the scaled transfer function is the blue line. When I do that, I find that I recover uh, most of the uh, peak amplitude uh, with the antenna drive when I hit uh, the resonance. And I get the same picture from the Mirnoff coils measuring magnetic uh, fluctuations as well. Um, now, I can look at these peaks in more detail, zoom in on one of them. Uh, here, what I'm showing is uh, the, the transfer function normalized by the peak height so that I can compare to diagnostics um, for a single scan of, of frequency, the frequency and the time on the, on the bottom here, for one of the discharges. And I, I go up and I go down. Another thing, and, and all of those uh, resonances on these three different diagnostics essentially have the same structure. Another thing that they have the same uh, structure in is the, is the phase. I'm crossing through about 180 degrees phase. It's just what I would expect uh, for a pole. Um, now, there's an offset added on, on this axis um, to help us view that 180-degree traversal. Um, now, here's a fun fact about simple poles. Um, if you plot a transfer function like this in the complex plane, sometimes called a Nyquist plot, you trace out a circle when you scan the frequency. So if I, if I start at a point and then I turn my frequency knob and increase the frequency and it goes up, and I plot the locus of points in the uh, complex plane, I trace out a circle. And if I'm increasing the frequency, 
tides circulate in the clockwise direction when the mode is damped. That is, when gamma is positive in this case. Um, so, okay, I try to fit uh, a function uh, uh, like this to the peaks. Uh, the, the simple pole does a good job of reproducing those peaks. Um, but, of course, I'm not interested just in magnitude. I also want to use the phase information. So I plot this transfer function in the complex plane, the Nyquist plots here at the top, for eight PCI cores, uh, eight different radii. Each one is tracing out this uh, circle in the complex plane. The, the, the blue is the data, uh, and the green is the, the fit to the data. And each one uh, circulates in a clockwise direction. Um, I can take the phase angle of the residue of those poles. I'm sort of finding this with these arrows here. And as I go outward from one pole to the next, the phase angle rotates. And I can do the same procedure as before and get a radial wave number uh, from the residue. When I do that, I get uh, the same value as I got before. And when I do this mapping exercise, I can turn that into a perpendicular wave number. And I get uh, the same antenna uh, perpendicular wave number. Here, I, I can take the time again to, to show what's happening. So the electron diamagnetic drift direction is up on the outward side uh, of the uh, plasma. And these cores are sampling down. Now, they strike the last closed flux surface, the PCI cores, in two places, one's here and one's here. Uh, but they only map on the bottom intersection. Uh, and if the mode is indeed, as we're measuring, having a, an outward uh, direction, uh, sort of a uh, positive uh, uh, major radial wave number. It's running this way, which is the projection of the electron diamagnetic drift direction in the major radial coordinate. Um, now, if I reverse the field, not surprisingly, the uh, direction of the uh, major radial wave number changes sign. Uh, I can also look at the center frequency of these peaks. Um, and so there's a lot of frequencies here. Let's take it apart. The black dashed line is the antenna drive frequency. Okay, the black solid line is the peak and PCI frequency. Remember, we're using that as a proxy for the QCM frequency. And the colored lines here are the center frequencies from all of the diagnostics which are mapped to the antenna on this discharge. Uh, we get one center frequency per scan from bottom to top or top to bottom. And those, uh, those uh, frequencies hit uh, the crossing between the antenna drive and the PCI peak frequency, the QCM proxy frequency, uh, for every scan. Now we, we sort of miss the mark here a bit at the end. We, we stopped hitting the, the QCM, so we don't get good resonances at that point. Not surprisingly. Um, now, in addition to looking at the center frequency, we can also look at uh, the width of, uh, of that uh, peak, and uh, looking at that gives you the damping rate. Um, we, we do a little fancier fitting, but that's the idea. When you calculate that damping rate, you get some number that settles to around 5%, usually between 5 and 10% on these discharges, a weekly damp resonance. And that's quite interesting. Uh, remember that we, in the background on some of these discharges, have a, an unstable QCM, and yet we're driving a, a damp to stable uh, resonance. What's going on? That, that makes us ask questions about uh, the um, now, I didn't get a, a lot of chance to talk about this, but uh, another of the fine points of this shoelace model we just bought uh, is that it can lock in real time uh, to a, this quasi-coherent mode fluctuation, other fluctuations as well. Uh, here's a demonstration of that. Um, so we're looking at this spectrogram here. Here's our QCM. It runs down and then wiggles. This little straight line here is the antenna when it's in a fixed uh, frequency program. Um, so we're gating the antenna current here, amplitude modulation, to help pick out the antenna current from the, uh, the antenna fluctuation from the QCM. Right around here, uh, the antenna uh, phase lock system locks to the QCM and starts following the QCM frequency. Um, and so uh, it's moving around. We turn the antenna on, off, on, off, but we stay with that frequency. And we hug it pretty well until the end where the QCM starts to break apart. Then we kind of average out the frequency there. Um, we hold a high current uh, near 80 amps for the duration of the discharge, even though we're scanning that frequency really, really fast. Um, and so that was a stress test for this system. We were happy with the results. We only had about good four good discharges with this system. Uh, so there's more work to do here, uh, maybe to get results.
results. Now, uh, an interesting puzzle. Uh, we think of the QCM now as a, a drip wave, uh, predominantly drip wave like This is coming out of, of Brian Labombard's recent work with the Langmuir probe. Uh, and these measurements, which are, for example, measuring uh, potential uh, fluctuation and density fluctuation phase, and that's a great fingerprint for the nature of the mode. Uh, so we're fairly confident in, the, in what kind of nature the QCM has, at least in the lower part uh, of the pedestal. And we designed the antenna to match, uh, basically. It has the same uh, perpendicular wave number of frequency. Uh, we expect it to be in the edge. Uh, so, and we see this resonant response around the QCM uh, frequency. So we, it's tempting to draw this line and say, oh, look, we, we drove the QCM mission accomplished. Uh, let's go have a nice dinner or something. In fact, um, in fact, we have some pause uh, before we can draw that line directly. And why is that? It, it goes back to this uh, field line guiding uh, puzzle. So uh, if the mode is a drift wave, we expect it to propagate in the perpendicular uh, direction from the drift wave dispersion uh, relation and, and the drift wave physics. And yet we say, OK, either you're mapped to the antenna or you're not. If you're not mapped to the antenna, you see nothing. Uh, so it looks like that mode is not uh, moving across the field. Uh, and being observed on all the other diagnostics. And why is that? So field line guided modes, we think of uh, maybe resonance cones. It turns out resonant cones are, are not at play here. Uh, the electrostatic modes that we might associate with these are collisionally damped besides the frequency is, is, is fall. What about shear albane waves? Well, that's nice. Uh, if we think of a shear albane eigen mode, the, the frequency of this is off. Uh, the shear albane continuum, why is there a resonance? Um, so we, and we also want to see is, is there a way that we can make a consistent picture where the antenna is driving something like a drip wave, a resonance which is a drip wave, but uh, somehow having these albanic uh, characteristics. So we might conjecture a story uh, to tell, to sort of tie these different uh, ideas together. Uh, so here I'm plotting again these field lines mapped to the antenna on the last closed flux surface. This black dashed line is the edge of the antenna. Uh, and you can see the antenna is very narrow relative to these, uh, these field lines. Here they're kind of going from the bottom of X point, these discharges, uh, these are the four field ones, to the top crest of the plasma. Um, so this, uh, this is roughly the connection <coughs> point. Um, and we estimate often the, the parallel wavelength um, uh, as being twice the connection length. This is about, uh, it turns out, 10 meters or so connection length. So the parallel wavelength is roughly 20 meters. Now, the Alvane speed uh, in this edge of the plasma and these discharges is about 3 million meters per second. So uh, remember, I asked that joke, uh, asked me what's new to see over lambda, haha. So let's use that little nice formula. I can pull out uh, what the frequency is, OK? The, 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 the Alvane speed, 3 million meters per second divided by this 20 meters, I get 150 kilohertz. Um, which is right around uh, the QCM frequency. I can play the same trick uh, for the uh, drift wave dispersion in relation. I take uh, the perpendicular wave number and the electron diamagnetic drift velocity, and there there's some ambiguity of where, what radius to evaluate that velocity at. But when I do that, I get a frequency in the same ballpark, a little over 100 kilohertz. Um, so there's, there's a possibility that these modes are coupling. Meanwhile, what may be happening is we drive a disturbance on the field line, and it runs uh, to the edges. It, it spreads out on the field line by alvanic dynamics. Uh, and even if the mode is propagating, by the time it gets off the antenna, it's already uh, greatly attenuated, having been spread out uh, by the alvanic uh, dynamics. This is, uh, of course, conjecture. We really need to make more measurements uh, before we can understand the nature of the mode that we're driving. But the, the point is, can you tell a story which is at least consistent with the mode still being a drift wave, or do you need to reject that hypothesis right now uh, based on the field line guide? Um, so uh, I come to the summary here uh, and talk about some other things coming up. So we built the shoelace antenna, uh, and it drove a high K per modes in the edge of the Alpha Corsium line. Tokamak was designed to match the QCM. The driven mode, uh, it always has a poloidal field component. Uh, it has a density component, but only in H mode when those steep gradients develop. By the way, either L3 H mode or EEA H mode. Um, 
Now, it propagates in the electron diamagnetic drift direction. This is significant, one, because the antenna has no preferred direction. Also, we did a parity uh, check with the, the direction of the field line, which is to say the powers that be had a field reversal, and we took advantage of it. Um, and so we were able to, to show that in, no matter the direction of uh, the field uh, and uh, current, we also get this propagation in the electron diamagnetic drift direction. Uh, the driven mode has the same perpendicular wave number it, as that composed by the antenna winding. Uh, it's resonant at the QCM frequency. Um, now, uh, also the, the, uh, the, the mode has a couple of differences with the QCM. One, it's weakly damped. Uh, the QCM is uh, unstable. Uh, how does that work? Uh, one, it follows field lines. Uh, it's guided by field lines, whereas the QCM fills up the low field side. It's, it's also balloon-like, but it fills up the low field side. Um, and also, you can get uh, a driven response uh, even before there's any QCM, or even when there's no QCM at all um, in, uh, in an L3 age mode. And so this says, okay, can we drive this resonance, and maybe can we, maybe can we drive transport uh, without any QCM? Isn't that what we wanted? We press a button. We, drive transport. Uh, however, we haven't measured any transport yet. Uh, one measurement we do have is, did we change the global confinement regime of Alcatraz CMOD? No. Uh, so, okay, uh, the shoelace antenna is not the transport actuator uh, that we want in the far future. Of course, that would be very ambitious to change this uh, whole uh, tokamak, which is dropping 500 megajoules in four seconds with a, a two kilowatt antenna. But the, the universe is a strange and beautiful place. Um, but anyway, it's a, certainly a necessary condition, perhaps, for our first start. It points us for some future work. Uh, it also makes us ask a question about the QCM. Is there some kind of damped drift wave resonance at uh, the edge of the plasma? Uh, and that's being rung uh, by uh, some kind of a free energy source, maybe further up the pedestal. We wonder about that. Um, and that also points a new research direction. Uh, we, we have a few questions to answer. Some specific questions are where radially is the driven mode? Uh, as well, what's the phase relationship again between the, the potential and density fluctuations? Uh, how is this driven mode related to the QCM, if at all? Uh, can the antenna interact with the QCM? So here we're looking for frequency pulling so I can drag the QCM frequency where I want. Or maybe uh, put some side bands in the QCM uh, frequency. And then can also I maybe feedback stabilize or stabilize uh, the QCM. Uh, and then we have to answer the question, does the antenna drive transport? These questions uh, we should be able to answer uh, in the summer campaign using the Mira Langmuir probe. Oh, I promised you I would talk about what happens when you put an antenna this close to the plasma. So we had a little bit of fireworks uh, at some point <coughs> toward the end of the 2012 campaign. Now, this glowing blob right here is the GH limiter, the main limiter. That's the, the big shield for the antenna. When your shield is blowing up, it's probably not a good sign for the thing behind the shield, um, which is this glowing blob, which is the shoelace antenna spewing molybdenum. Um, so this is what happens after we crawl inside the machine and survey the damage. And we have a little break here and a little break here. Um, and so we, we broke the antenna first in one place. Then, amazingly, it, it self-healed and patched itself. And then we could turn it on and have half an antenna for a little while till that broke. Then we got a second fold. Um, and then we had this broken antenna, but we took it out and we relaced it. And while we were at it, we, uh, we took the liberty of changing the pitch, making it a little shallower, so that now the antenna maps uh, to many other diagnostics. It's aligned with the magnetic field lines of the equilibrium field. Um, for the range of Q95, first of all, that's more typical of CMOD plasmas. But also, now we can connect to this little blue X here, which is the Mira Langmuir probe, where it kind of scans in, sort of, you know, let's call it a snake tongue. It plucks in and samples uh, the air before it, uh, or plasma, before it uh, uh, melts and dies. So uh, we have this uh, X here, and we can use it to, to measure these uh, important quantities, the radial location, the phase relationship between fluctuating quantities that we wanted. Um, and so that's exciting work coming up. Also, we put a hole in the antenna. We sort of did the plasma's work for it. Um, so we, we have a gap here, right where the heat flux is biggest. 
Um, so, well, that is to say where the antenna is, is closest also to the plasma. Um, and this way, we hope the antenna will be more robust. Um, we are also upgrading the power from 2 kilowatts to over 8 kilowatts. This should happen in June. We'll be hitting the limits of our uh, matching network here um, and also getting over 160 amps in the antenna. Um, and so this will be uh, allowing us to reach deeper into the plasma. Also, again, as I mentioned, uh, with this new line, we, mac, uh, we match the, the field lines of the plasma and the typical CMOD discharges. This means that we'll be able to run the antenna uh, in what we call piggyback mode, just whenever anybody will let us run it. It'll usually uh, work and maybe be useful. Um, so some of the experimental agenda for the antenna uh, this summer, we want to run the antenna in ELM 3H modes. These are uh, H modes without edge localized modes, without QCM or loop coherent mode. Um, and we can look at uh, the, the antenna driven uh, fluctuation in the absence of a QCM, uh, try to calculate and characterize it by itself uh, with the neural language. So we also want to revisit some of these EDAH mode experiments um, and see if we can affect the quasi-coherent mode. As well, we can try to see how that pole changes. For example, there's some interesting work coming out now showing uh, that the lower hybrid antenna has a profound effect on the quasi-coherent mode. You can use the antenna as an active probe to see how that pole is changing. Uh, we can also try to do the same experiments in the I mode, uh, some people call the improved L mode, uh, which has this weakly coherent mode. We can look again for resonances and interaction with the weakly coherent mode and study the, the pedestal response there. We have some theory work underway uh, using the BAUT++ framework. It's a, it's a parallel uh, code for simulating uh, plasma fluid uh, models. Um, we also are going to try to start up some work in console. And uh, we can keep cracking away at pencil and paper methods as well. Uh, now uh, it's traditional in the Plasma Science Infusion Center to answer the big picture questions <laughs> at the end of the talk. Um, so uh, let's see, how does the shoelace antenna fit into this bigger picture and get us to uh, a fusion power? Uh, so the, the, the high level goal that we were sort of thinking about, one of them, was uh, push a button control transport, a transport actuator. Uh, did we achieve that goal? Um, so now we have to do the normal thing we do in science. We say a little yes, a little no. Um, so did we drive uh, an edge fluctuation? Yes. Does that edge fluctuation sort of look like the ones which are responsible for flushing impurities? Yes. Okay, that's sort of a necessary condition for this concept uh, for, for driving uh, uh, these modes. However, um, did we change the global confinement regime? No, we did not. Um, do we even know that we're driving transport with the antenna? Not yet, hopefully we will this summer. Um, so those are outstanding questions that have to be answered. On top of that, could you put the shoelace antenna on uh, even either, let alone a full-size reactor? Well, we saw what happens when you put the shoelace antenna close to CMOT. Now CMOT has some of the highest uh, power fluxes uh, of any tokamak in the world. Um, but a real reactor is going to be even more damaging, and remember, it's uh, going to be on 24-7. So certainly, uh, this kind of uh, wire concept with a high perpendicular uh, wave number is not going to cut it on a full-size reactor. Um, so there you have to think about methods to perhaps drive these current filaments using structures that are further away from the plasma, uh, or trying to find modes with longer perpendicular wavelengths, or trying to find a safer place uh, for this antenna. Um, so that's sort of the big, long picture of uh, thinking of this idea of exploiting edge fluctuations, uh, driving them actively, try to control transport. Okay, so uh, this has been a CMI production, uh, and I thank you for your attention, and I'll take your questions.
being an engineer, I'd like to bring the discussion a little more on the antenna design, since uh, uh, I understand that's a big part of your contribution. I'd like, I'd like, I'd like you to highlight more of uh, possible contributions in that side. For example, um, I th it looks like you're trying to achieve some uh, canceling opposing dipoles from I think dipoles of this antenna, but there are many other ways to do that. The latest configuration is one possible way. I could just keep yes, winding consecutively yeah. and can do a lace and it looks like I'm accumulating some delay along the line. Right, right. Is that on purpose? I, what are you trying right. to do with this? So give me some intuition, some creativity. What, what are you after? Right. So so one, um, it, it looks like this would be standing wave on the line and I could do that uh, trick as well, get different phases on the runs. But actually the, the wavelength is many hundreds of, of meters while the antenna wire is you know, just a you know, order 10 meters long. So okay. there's no there's standing no wave on the line. Okay. Um, it's also, you know, it's not self-similar. Then it doesn't matter. Then it doesn't matter how you wind it. Or that right. You, you know, essentially the, the the current phase is is the same everywhere right. on the line. Okay. Um, so then why that way? Yeah. So so first of all, I don't know if Steve Pitch is uh, in the room, but you know, uh, he likes to call uh, even antennas at the ICRF frequency, which are around 80 megahertz, flux oh. couplers. Um, so he, he sort of shies away from the idea of, of an antenna because this is not a you know, far field radiation pattern. Um, this is sort of making a, a, a wiggle very close to the antenna near field um, and, and trying to uh, induce fluctuations in the plasma. You can drive modes that propagate long distances in the plasma, but in vacuum, uh, it, you have a, a very rapid fall off. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, now why do we have this, uh, this back and forth and meandering pattern? Um, you know, this is, there are a couple of different ways you could, you could think about doing this. You could have buses, um, you know, and just drive this bus one side or the other and drive current moments that way. But uh, no matter what you do, you want to have a, a structure which reproduces the perpendicular wave number of the mode uh, so that you get this resonance. Now you can have, uh, you can do this in more than one way. And one way is with this self-similar structure like this uh, spiral of Archimedes looking uh, structure. Um, but that uh, is broadband uh, in a perpendicular wave number. And we want to pick out a particular wave number which is associated with the QCM. So uh, basically what we do is we take the same structure as the intrinsic mode, which is these uh, near spaced uh, perpendicular filaments. And we do the same thing on the outside, and we induce mirror currents on the inside, which look just like the ones on the outside, which are designed to look like the bicycle hearing board. So that's uh, where the idea for this structure comes from. Actually, following that, uh, Ed, is there any indication of the separation of the two wave numbers in your measurements? Uh, in other words, you're, you're citing plus and minus. So, so you expect one to propagate with the dynamic drift and the other one opposing it. Uh, well, so is that differentiable? In that's, so we, we never <coughs> see uh, a, a mode which is running uh, in the ion diamagnetic drift direction. So we, we're able to drive uh, either direction, but nothing propagates in the ion diamagnetic drift direction. Only right. the electron. And you, but do you have the measurements to show that that doesn't occur? Yeah, you would you would see sort of this uh, uh, scanning uh, uh, wave number if that were the case, uh, just sort of flipping back and forth between the directions instead of hugging uh, one side. Also, for example, in that uh, radial uh, wave number plot that we were looking at, you would see a feature on both uh, the positive and negative sides of the radial wave number, uh, looking at the fluctuation going this way and that way. Instead, we see only one that comes out in forward field discharges uh, in for reverse. So Ted, you didn't give us any um, hint or conjecture as to why you're not seeing anything in an element in case. Yeah, yes. Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, so one of the possibilities, uh, so the, the gradients in L mode are, are very shallow. We don't have these uh, transport barriers at the edge. Um, now, if we're thinking that the, the, the mode that the antenna drives is a drift wave, um, you know, that gives us this dispersion relation of uh, omega equal to k per the star, d star, the electron dot, and the drift velocity. But uh, basically, it tells us where we're, uh, drift wave resonance might be. Uh, now, the electron diamagnetic uh, drift velocity goes as 1 over the, the scale length of the gradient. So if my gradient is not steep, it's shallow, I have a long um, uh, gradient length scale, 
and that tends to suppress, push down uh, my uh, frequency. It may be pushing down this resonant frequency underneath uh, the range that we have available to scan. So it's possible that uh, if you drive uh, the antenna into a, a lower frequency range, you'll still hit uh, a resonance in L mode, just uh, below where we can take now. That's one possibility. Um, 